Uh, Latin America is one of seven priority areas of research for UNM. And we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through programming. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge that the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We great, gratefully recognize our history. So today's talk, queer and trans migrations, dynamics of illegalization, detention and deportation is part of LAI's series uh, this year on immigration and human rights. Uh, and it's co-sponsored by the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, the Alfonso Ortiz Center and El Centro de la Raza. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, just the format, there'll be the talk and then there'll be uh, time for question and answers. Um, and so we'll, what we're going to do though is ask people to, to type their, their um, questions into the chat uh, and we'll get to those uh, at, at the end of the, of the presentation. So it's a great honor to introduce our speakers, Karma Chavez and Ethna Lubaid. Uh, Karma Chavez teaches, writes, and currently serves as chair in the Department of Mexican American and uh, Latina Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where she also holds several affiliate faculty appointments. She's published three co-edited volumes, a book of interviews called Palestine on the Air, and monographs entitled Queer Migration Politics, Activist Rhetoric and Coalitional Possibilities, and The Borders of AIDS, Race, Quarantine, and Resistance. Ethna Lubey is Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona and the former director of the Institute for LGBT Studies at the University of Arizona. She's the author of Entry Denied, Controlling Sexuality at the Border and Pregnant on Arrival, Making the Quote Illegal, illegal Unquote Immigrant. Uh, she's also the co-editor of three volumes and the um, editor of a special issue of the Journal of Lesbian Studies on Lives That Resist Telling, Migrant and Refugee Lesbians, and of an issue of GLQ on Queer Migrations. So please join me in welcoming Professors Chavez and Lubaid. So Karma and I would like to extend our warmest thanks to Francis, to Marlene Linares Gonzalez, and to the Latin American and Iberian Institute for inviting us to be able to talk with all of you today. And we wanna thank each of you who has taken time to be here today and be part of the conversation. What we're gonna do is first of all, tell you a little about what prompted us to create our edited collection, Queer and Trans Migrations, dynamics of illegalization, detention and deportation. And that has to do with the political and historical moment that we're in and where public and scholarly discussions are at. We'll also talk about why we thought it was important to have academics, activists and artists together and the kind of work we hope this book can inspire in the world. And after that, we'll share short excerpts from our individual chapters. So we decided to work on the book after we co-organized a conference on queer migration in 2014, which happened just before the so-called child migrant crisis that summer. We envisioned the book as a companion to Ethna's earlier co-edited volume, Queer Migration, Sexuality, U.S. Citizenship and Border Crossing, which centered queer of color migrants and communities and questions of border crossing and citizenship. My book, Queer Migration Politics, was also in print and widely circulating, as was a growing body of work in trans migration studies. And so it, it seemed like the right time to broaden queer and trans migration conversations to take up increasingly urgent issues of criminalization, detention, and deportation. So we put out a call for chapters for the book in 2017, as everyone was living with the dire effects of the newest rounds of racial capitalism, colonialism, settler colonialism, and state terror all of them working through normative gender and sexuality logics. In this context, untold millions of people around the world were being continued to be forced into migration. And yet countries like the United States that play key roles in generating migration, including through unjust trade and economic policies, invasion, 
warfare, policies fueling the climate crisis and more are not addressing their role in generating migration and instead are further slamming the door, building walls and criminalizing migrants. We know that that sort of response has routed untold numbers of people into situations where they risk their safety and their lives. They are unable to access legal status. They live under conditions of exploitation while being ineligible for the most basic assistance or care. And they remain vulnerable to separation from family and friends at any moment through deportation. And we know documented migrants are also increasingly criminalized and routed into detention and deportation. And people seeking asylum are criminalized, penned up or driven out and subject to extraordinary levels of terror, violence and abandonment. These logics and practices stem from and legitimize settler colonial, racist, heterosexist, transphobic, and anti-poor policies and practices toward US citizens. Further contributing to the current situation has been the extraordinary levels of state and private investment in walls, cages, surveillance, in cruelty, brutality, unaccountability, and state and corporate lawlessness, even as basic collective goods and services like food, shelter, healthcare, and education are rolled back and people, both migrant and citizen, are experiencing what Elizabeth Povanelli calls economies of abandonment. The pandemic, as we know, has further deepened these dynamics and this suffering. Media and politicians, whether Republican or Democrat, tend to frame migrants and marginalized US communities as somehow causing the current crisis. But the contributors to this book flip the script. They call it the carceral nation state, corporations, and white supremacist, anti-Black, settler, colonial, and patriarchal logics and practices as the source of the crisis and is needing to be transformed or abolished. So I'm going to just uh, put up briefly here uh, the, the table of contents. Uh, so the book, while um, I talked to you a little bit about what we think that contributions do. So all of the contributions help us to analyze and understand the current structures of power that are creating these conditions of dispossession and suffering. They help us to make links among struggles so that we can understand how the illegalization, detention, and deportation of queer migrants, queer and trans migrants, connects with the movement for Black lives, feminist politics, and prison abolition. They help us make connections among struggles at different scales, from the most local to the global. For nation state migration, detention, deportation, and security regimes draw from and cite one another to legitimate their actions, just like capitalism creates the scripts for countries and corporations alike to draw and exploit migrant labor and black, native, brown, female, poor, queer, and trans labor profiting at every step. Now, contributions to this book also document extraordinary histories of refusal, resistance, and dreaming and working toward a different world that's not just about surviving, but about thriving, starting not with rich white men, but with communities that have faced the most harm under the current system. And these contributors remind us that we all have a part to play in making change, which varies depending on your circumstances, but everything counts Everything matters and every effort helps. In the book, we use the concept of queer and trans in a double sense. They're used both as identity categories and as analytic rubrics. As identity categories, queer and trans, like the categories lesbian, gay, bisexual, heterosexual, cisgender, transformista, loca, bakla, and many related terms require scholars and activists to navigate complicated political, ethical, and theoretical mandates. And this is because there is nothing essential, universal, timeless, or unchanging about the terms. They have emerged through and remain implicated in histories and geographies of power. They involve self-attribution or attribution by others, they are tied to and uphold state regimes for making populations legible and governable. And they offer compromised and yet important means for making claims and fashioning one's life. 
the essays navigate these complexities in ways that honor the experience, vision, and work of people who self-identify as queer and trans migrants. We also use queer and trans as analytic rubrics that may or may not refer to identities or identifications at all. My essay, which I'll talk about shortly, offers one example of how this works. Moreover, the book as a whole uses a queer studies framework. This is different from a lesbian and gay studies framework because it refuses the idea of that sexual gender or other identities are essential or trans historical and instead explores how the distinctions between normal versus abnormal sexualities and genders get created and the regimes of power and domination that are involved. A queer analysis makes clear that the processes for producing sexual and gender norms are inextricable from dynamics of capitalism, colonialism, settler colonialism, racialization, and nation formation. Queer analysis also commonly uses a heteronormativity framework, which we also use. Heteronormativity, which is not the same as heterosexuality, suggests that all societies are structured around sexual and intimate norms that are not everywhere and always the same, but generally normalize and privilege sexuality channeled into childbearing within male-female marriage among the dominant ethnic, racial, and class group. That norm produces a range of subaltern groups, including lesbians, gay men, and trans people, and also poor and racialized women who birth children, sex workers, and others who do not match up to or adhere to sexual and intimate norms. While our book centers queer and trans identified migrants and organizations, it is in conversation with migrant justice struggles of all sorts that are seen as linked in struggles against heteronormativity. The book acknowledges and honors important changes we have seen over the last two decades, including that queer and trans migrants are increasingly visible at the forefront of extraordinary social movements, organizing efforts, and cultural work that has redefined how we understand and work for queer and migrant justice. In 2007, Queers for Economic Justice released Queers and Immigration, a vision statement, which envisioned transforming the immigration system in ways that centered the priorities of queer and trans people and communities that are most harmed by current policies. Since that date, numerous activists, artists, and artivist groups have emerged. In the United States, these include the Trans Latina Coalition, the Immigrant Youth Justice League, United We Dream, Culture Strike that is now the Center for Cultural Power, the Queer Undocumented Immigrant Project, Mariposa Sin Fronteras, Familia Trans Queer Liberation, Trans Queer Pueblo, the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, the Black LGBTQ Plus Migrant Project, and many, many others. If you read the contributor biographies at the back of the book, you'll see the extraordinary array of social justice projects and organizations that they work with. All of these efforts have made important inroads into checking the gender and sexual normativity of the immigrant movement setting queer and trans-centered migration agendas, challenging the treatment of trans and queer migrants in detention, and much more. And that kind of work is also evident around the world with organizations like the Forcibly Displaced Peoples Network, the African LGBTQI plus migrant network, Rainbow Refugee, and many others. Now in creating the book, we didn't try to produce something that we claim is quote unquote representative, which would be impossible, but instead issued an open call that invited grounded cutting edge work that helps us understand the moment we're in and how to move forward in transformative ways. Queer and trans migrations remains heavy on con contributors from and research about the United States. This troubling overrepresentation reflects US power and hegemony in the production and circulation of academic knowledge. The book is not intended to suggest that US experiences are universal or generalizable, and contributors also engage processes of illegalization, detention, and deportation in places like Turkey, Greece, Canada, as well as Native nations. The book overall came about because of the urgency of the current moment, the need to continue having conversations like we're having today with all of you and taking action, and the importance of ensuring work remains centered on racial, gender, sexual, economic, settler, colonial, and geopolitical justice that begins from the priorities of those who are most harmed by the current system. 
I'm certainly glad Donald Trump did not get a second term and President Biden has begun taking some immediate action on immigration that will be helpful. But we know Biden's agenda is hardly radical and he will face an uphill battle in making even minimal changes. That suggests the work must continue in these times that are difficult and yet they're also times of possibility. These are times when people have been coming together and demanding big changes that were not part of public conversations even a few years ago. These include demands to abolish ICE, abolish detention, abolish DHS, abolish the police, abolish prison, abolish racial capitalism, let migrants stay, and rebuild communities to ensure not just surviving but thriving. The book documents some of these histories and some of the tools that have helped to get us to this point. I think of it as a work of love and thanks and a call to keep going. And we did want to tell you that all royalties from the book will be donated to support the organization Mariposas Sin Fronteras that has been doing this kind of work for several decades now. That's a little about the book as a whole. And what we're gonna do next is share a little from our individual chapters. I'll share first, then Karma, and then we'll open up. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. So I'm gonna start my chapter by just sharing a brief story, which is that in April, 2014, current and formerly undocumented migrants released recommendations that urged President Obama to stop migrant deportation and undo the laws and practices that were pipelining as many as 400,000 people a year into deportation. The group described itself as a blue ribbon commission and it included queer and trans identified migrants. Their recommendations came in response to President Obama's problematic call to make deportation quote, more humane using a consultative process that did not include undocumented migrants or the communities most affected by deportation. Typically, a Blue Ribbon Commission is comprised by, quote, exceptional people who are appointed to investigate, study, or analyze a given question. Its members do not have direct authority, but being on the commission signals you are considered to be among the best and the brightest, and that your recommendations should be, quote, used by those with decision-making power to take action. The move by undocumented and formerly undocumented migrants to constitute themselves as a Blue Ribbon Commission brilliantly appropriated standard government strategies for addressing important issues. Although immigration law, backed by state violence, constructs undocumented people as neither present nor having a political voice, the Blue Ribbon Commission insisted members' voices should be heard and recognized as expert and their recommendations to dismantle the deportation pipeline should be taken seriously. I open my chapter with this story because the release of the commission's recommendations reflects the struggles and concerns that motivated our collection and this chapter. The United States has the largest detention and deportation system in the world. And my chapter tells the story of how we got to this place. Many others have done that, but what I wanted to do is tell it in a way that centered queer and trans migrants who are usually left out of the scholarship. I explain where they fit into larger dynamics of migration, the policies through which people become documented or not, the way certain folks are disproportionately routed into detention and what that's like, and the creative innovative responses and challenges that they have implemented. My chapter first explains how US immigration controls reproduce and normalize a heteronormative US nation and citizenry. My approach treats migration controls not as simply passively managing already existing conditions and relations of power but rather as actively contributing to the production and normalization of deeply unequal social relationships. The chapter engages the vast scholarship about migration controls as being central to capitalist logics, settler colonialism and racial formation, but expands the scholarship by drawing attention to gender and sexuality as axes of power 
and heteronormativity as thoroughly organizing national norms and social relations, and showing that all this translates into immigration policies and practices, including around deportation. The chapter next engages the scholarship about how we understand living as an undocumented person. We know mainstream media and public discourse suggest that undocumented status reflects the supposedly quote undesirable character of individual migrants who have quote broken the law. This individualizing and depoliticizing approach completely ignores the dynamics that drive migration, the US's role in those dynamics, and the ways US migration policies then route displaced people into undocumented status. Reframed in this way, to be without documents is not about being a quote type of person, but about being dispossessed and made exploitable through relations of power and knowledge that need to be challenged. And what I add to the scholarship here is understanding how sexuality and gender, as well as heteronormative norms, are central to dynamics that leave people undocumented. We know that rather than addressing conditions and dynamics that are routing millions into undocumented status, the US has instead expanded the criminalization of migration, militarized the borders, expanded the array of authorities involved in policing everyone's status, and massively expanded detention and deportation. And this was not just under Trump, but since the 1980s under Democrats and Republicans alike. So the third section of the chapter talks about these dynamics and where queer and trans identified migrants fit in and what they experience. This section explores how sexual and gender logics in their intersection with economic dispossession, racialization, settler colonialism and empire shape who is targeted for detention and deportation. A heteronormativity framework is especially useful because as Tanya Golash Boza shows, working class men from Latin America and the Caribbean are overwhelmingly targeted for deportation. Monisha Dasgupta argues that these men are targeted, quote, precisely because they cannot and do not structurally live up to the gender and sexual norms that are prescribed by white settler heteronormativity. We know LGBTQ migrants, especially when they are trans women, from migrants of color, migrants from Latin America or the Caribbean, and our poor people are also highly vulnerable to being targeted. In detentions, conditions are organized around and perpetuate sexualized, gendered, racialized, and economic violence, which has been thoroughly documented in innumerable reports about cruel, abusive, neglectful, and literally life-threatening conditions. Despite these decades of documentation, ICE, Border Patrol, and DHS continue to operate with impunity and have expanded their capacity to detain. Queer and trans migrants who are positioned at the intersection of multiple identities, hierarchies, and movements that often either I've overlooked them or else seek advancement at their expense have emerged as leaders and have made significant intervention into the framing of demands and the tactics that are being used to challenge detention, deportation, and the migration system as a whole. Their work makes connections to justice struggles being waged by subaltern US citizens, including for economic redistribution, Black Lives to Matter, an end to mass incarceration, reproductive justice, trans and queer justice, environmental justice, and much more. Understanding that the struggles of migrants and subaltern citizens are thoroughly intertwined Queer and trans migrants create what karma describes as coalitional moments that re-envision and reconstruct imaginaries concerning possibilities for radical social and political change. Protest against queer and trans detention in particular has sparked met coalitional organizing. In 2011, in a series of groundbreaking complaints that were a series of groundbreaking complaints were filed against DHS on behalf of detained LGBT migrants. 
In response, DHS created a special detention unit for transgender and gay migrants, the so-called LGBT pod. And yet reports of abuse of LGBT detainees continued, leading to nationwide protests and congressional concerns that continue to this day. In 2015, Geneset Gutierrez, an undocumented trans migrant from Mexico, interrupted President Obama at a White House event to protest the abuse of detained trans migrants and to demand the release of all detained people. In 2016, undocumented trans and queer migrants bravely went on a hunger strike to protest LGBT detention and all immigrant detention. Queer and trans migrants have mobilized around the arrival of caravans of gay and trans Central American migrants who have been seeking asylum in the US in 2017, 2018, and they've mobilized around numerous other struggles. This is an image from the book that shows two of the trans women who were part of the 27 caravan um, that arrived from Central America to the border. Struggles against migrant illegalization, detention, and deportation have deeply tangled roots that connect multiple forms of violence and freedom dreams. I wanted to describe these roots in ways that center queer and trans migrants as both targets of the system and as leaders in envisioning and creating alternatives that connect to freedom struggles everywhere. I believe understanding these entanglements offers resources, roadmaps, and inspiration for all of us as this struggle continues. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Karma who will share from her chapter. All right, thank you. So I, I'm just gonna read a short excerpt uh, from my chapter in the book, which is co-authored uh, with my colleague, Hannah Masri, uh, who is uh, just finished her PhD at Texas last spring and is a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. So at the same time as the 2014 child migrant crisis covered the news, immigration rights organizations decried the separation of families and Obama gave speeches around the country. He crafted shifts in immigration policy to increase penalty for smugglers, as well as to get appropriations for initiatives, including a border security surge, an aggressive deterrent strategy, and the resources to appropriately detain, process, and care for children and adults. Put simply, the political theater of this humanitarian crisis, which embraces the child, uh, the figure of the child, would be used toward punitive ends, more resources for homeland security, including border militarization, detention, and deportation systems. Despite this conservative agenda, Congress refused to assist Obama, but he did not have to wait for Congress. Via executive action, the Obama administration announced the discontinuance of the Controversial Secure Communities, or ESCOM program in November, 2014. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services summarized the purpose and content of Obama's executive actions in the following way. They wrote, on November 20th, 2014, the president announced a series of executive actions to crack down on illegal immigration at the border, prioritize deporting felons, not families, and require certain undocumented immigrants to pass a criminal background check and pay taxes in order to temporarily stay in the U.S. without fear of deportation. News reports and immigrant rights organizations press releases primarily centered their attention on this last action, the proposed extension of DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, to be applied to the undocumented parents of US citizens or legal permanent residents. Few of these press releases or reports emphasize the enforcement actions, specifically that Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson introduced as PEP, a priority enforcement program. Now, unlike ESCOM, under PEP, immigration officials would target only quote unquote high priority groups, such as quote, those who threaten national security, public safety, or border security, as well as those convicted of three non-traffic misdemeanors and those with quote, other immigration violations. Arguably, these priority groups could expand to include nearly every deportable person, especially under the ambiguous purview of the third category. Now, in the face of years of advocate and activist outrage that Obama's deportation practices divided hundreds of thousands of families by deporting nearly 3 million people since 2009, 
The administration's framing device, deporting, quote, felons, not families, clearly responded directly to established immigrant rights rhetoric. The catchphrase's responsive rhetoric is further obvious because the immigrant rights movement's pro-family rhetoric has often been paired with contentions that immigrants are not criminals. Felons, not families, thus mirrors the demands of the mainstream immigrant rights movement. In their framing, both Obama and the mainstream immigrant movement ignore families with felons, a significant problem since black and brown immigrants in particular, like their citizen counterparts, are much more likely to have police encounters resulting in arrest and prosecution than white people. In suggesting that he heard the will of the people and changed course to deport felons, not families in light of the crisis of children on the border, Obama was able to continue to use family rhetoric, not as a distraction from the material realities of his policies for families and non-families alike, but actually to justify those policies and to naturalize a particular kind of law-abiding family that the nation values. Numerous advocates celebrated Obama's 2014 Deferred Action Extension, but some queer migration activists lamented the extension's exclusions, focusing on who PEP targeted as deportable priorities. Such activists noted that the following groups were excluded from the deferred action order. Parents of undocumented youth who benefited from the 2012 DACA. Seasonal workers without connections to US citizen children. LGBT migrants, especially youth and trans people who are more likely to have been homeless and therefore to have committed low level criminal offenses. Domestic violence survivors who can't get visas under the Violence Against Women Act and black immigrants who are more likely to be racially profiled by police and therefore either have a felony record or have family members who do. The Obama administration either did not acknowledge the family relationships of these groups as real or includable, or the administration fa failed to acknowledge how even real families might harm each other, creating conditions that put someone in a deportable position. For example, a young person flees domestic violence and then commits theft in order to survive. Partners in the Not One More Deportation campaign, a campaign centrally organized by queer and trans migration activists that claimed a big role in pushing Obama to issue executive orders, also challenged Obama's felons, not families framing, elaborating on some of the points I mentioned above. Yesenia Valdez, a national organizer for Familia, trans and queer liberation movement noted, as a community, we know that we do not fit the normal definition of families that continue to dominate public discourse. Many LGBTQ undocumented immigrants do not have families that are US citizens or permanent residents that could allow them to qualify for the program. Additionally, we know that our community, especially trans women of color, is unfairly targeted by law enforcement through racial discrimination or for engaging in survival sex work. These daily realities mean that members of our LGBTQ community will be left out of the president's plan. Opal Tometi, the executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and co-founder of Black Lives Matter, a group that centers queer and trans perspectives, emphasized the point that law enforcement measures are always more impactful on Black people. And then she added, we won't stand for a system that criminalizes us and then pits family against people who may have a criminal record. Tometi's comments also draw attention to the narrow definition of family prescribed in Obama's executive actions, as well as the damage done to numerous families by false divisions between alleged families and felons. Thus, the logics underlying Obama's response to the quote unquote child migration crisis, logics introduced by liberal immigration organizations, not only traffic and understandings that strengthen the very conditions that create child migrants in the first place, they also function to expand the categories of undesirable immigrants and to marginalize various communities of color. So I'll leave the excerpt there and go to a question and answer. Thank you, Carmen and you for such a um, engaging discussion on what's undoubtedly an important topic. So um, if anyone has any questions, please include them in the chat and then I'll read them off to our, our panelists. I have a question from Alexa. It says, what are some steps slash actions that citizens can take to help support queer migrants? Well, um, I mean, I think the some of the organizations that we mentioned, um, so Mariposa Sin Fronteras, which is where all of our proceeds from our book goes, um, uh, you, you know, Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, Queer Undocumented Immigrant Project. There's a lot of these projects that I think um, 
need our uh, financial and rhetorical support. Um, so they're not spaces for us if we're U.S. citizens, but they are spaces for us to do work as allies and really to support uh, and to um, amplify their messages. So I always think that's a, a great place to start. I think the other thing that, that we can do um, is really keep pressure on our elected officials because that's really something that um, you know undocumented folks do and they do better than citizens a lot of times, but ultimately they don't have the power of the vote, right? And so I think um, even for those of us who are very suspicious of what citizenship is and, and question whether it should even exist, um, that is something that we can do is really uh, ensure that, um, you know, our elected officials don't sell out our communities. And I might just add like totally what Karma said, you know, there are organizations dealing with that, all support counts, all support helps, but Karma I think also emphasized, right, you know, those of us who hold citizenship, um, are there to be allies, not to, to follow the lead of those organizations and the priorities that they have set. Um, some of the kinds of campaigns that I hear a lot of talk about in the region where I live, which is Tucson, Arizona, is also um, work around decriminalization and the defund hate campaign, those kinds of campaigns. Um, and those of us who have legal status or citizenship, you know, as Karma said, be strategic in using it um, to demand ending criminalization, defunding hate and other measures like that. I mean, all, all of those measures are helpful and there are many, many um, measures that can be taken. So um, we can put those out there. And I, I'm, I know you also have ideas that you, you might want to try out. And that's also good. Looks like there's a comment from Juliana. Thank you for sharing your chapters and the projects and organizations you're working with, since we are in need to continuing to put pressure on a very conservative democracy in the United States. I mean, all I can say is yes, exactly. And thank you, Juliana. You know, that's why we hope the work is out there. It's just people are doing extraordinary work that's very inspiring. So partly we also just wanted to share in this difficult moment that there are lots and lots of routes that people have already forged on which to build um, and to be in conversation together about what we can do individually, collectively, based on where we are or in other ways. This all really matters at this moment. Yeah, definitely. Um, and thinking about it, just saw your other question, what steps do you think the Biden administration will take towards ICE? I mean, this is why, um, you know, we've, we really try, I think a lot of people who do this work really try to de-emphasize Trump, uh, to de-emphasize Republicans in general, because Democrats ha have been historically uh, just as, not maybe just as bad, but basically just as bad as allies. Uh, and so I think there's a, a way in which if, Biden's selections for appointments, et cetera, which are completely in line with the Obama administration, if that's any indication of how he's gonna be on immigration, uh, we can't expect much. Um, although the rhetorical landscape he's entering into is very different than Obama entered into. And um, he's a white guy, not a black guy. And uh, I do think that um, potentially, you know, we know how white privilege works, right? Um, so it, it's possible that he might be more liberal because he won't have to deal with all the, or more progressive rather, because he won't have to deal with all the um, baggage Obama did, but I don't expect much. I don't expect much, but what I'm hoping for always is abolish ICE, defund hate, right? Um, and then every day you see, I read more things that make it seem very difficult, like Biden had put out, he's going to put a hundred day moratorium on deportations. 
And then it came out that the Trump administration had signed deals with all these conservative states and with the ICE Border Patrol Union um, that ties the hands of Biden in terms of his ability to make change. So part of what he's going to have to do is unravel all of those structures. Um, and I hope he does do that, but he will not do that without this kind of pressure. Um, so that's just a comment on the, the difficulties that we see are, are really enormous um, because, e because even under Obama and Biden, what we saw was, you know, when Biden even put in mild, sorry, Obama put in mild reforms, um, ICE often refused to implement them. Um, they're like, we don't care. We don't have to do what you said. So, so the question of accountability and what can we do about that is, I think, absolutely something we're going to have to keep talking about. Yeah. Beth Davila says, I'm thinking about the power of language to define and create. I wonder if there are ways that we might change our own language practices as educators and scholars in relation to supporting our queer and trans undocumented slash documented students and communities. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually wondering if Beth, if you wanna say some of the ideas you have in, in uh, response to what you're thinking about, um, if you're comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I don't have specific ideas, but I know that there are a lot of people who have statements within their syllabi, for example, that talk about um, working with meeting the special needs of an undocumented community. And then my own research looks at the ways that we perpetuate whiteness in our language. And so I'm just trying to push myself to think through, are there ways that when even when we're trying to be allies, when we talk about these communities that we're still marginalizing queer and trans community within the larger community, right? So are there ways that we need to be centering those needs or more um, change our language in order to be more inclusive, I guess? You know, one of the things I'm thinking about, thanks for that, Beth, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about in that regard is, um, you know, kind of the, the whole, if you think about like early education theorists in the United States, you know, John Dewey, folks like this, like the whole project of, of U.S. publication, public education was to create good citizens, right? And I think one of the big things that we can all do, that's a little thing that doesn't maybe directly address what you're saying, but is to really uh, get rid of citizenship language in our teaching, in our syllabi, in sort of our objectives, or even we talk about, you know, uh, when we mean to say people and we use citizens instead as the language, um, uh, to me, that's one little thing that we can do to think about uh, a, a real deep material human rights frame, um, not kind of the surface level one that, that we're used to getting from the UN and other organizations, but, um, and also that uh, I think functions to really question the primacy of the nation state. If we're not really worried about citizenry, we're not really worried about producing good citizens, our role as educators, but we actually are um, engaged in projects of justice for people or however you think about it. I think that's just one thing that comes to mind in response to what you're saying. I also really appreciate the comment and I feel like that is a kind of ongoing situation. Like in, in my, I'm teaching a migration course and part of the very material of what are we doing has to be ongoing discussions about those issues and, and structures of like whose voices get heard in the classroom, what kinds of projects are put forward. But related to what Karma was talking about, I was thinking there was somebody who went through the University of Arizona to look at all um, award scholarships and fellowships and to eliminate citizenship as a requirement from every single one of them where possible. And it was a tiny tweak and yet it opened up options for students that hadn't been there. Um, but it was also a good inventory for everybody else about um, the racism and the nation centrism of a lot of the structures of our universities. Mm -hmm. Other folks might want to pitch in on this one too. I mean, it's such a really important topic. Yeah, feel free to jump in if you have thoughts on that. Hello. 
Well, um, I like to say something. I just feel, thank you for bringing this up. I just feel like this is so interesting to hear. I'm, I'm an immigrant who have citizenship. Now I'm naturalized um, American and my brother is going through the process and uh, he's having a really hard time. I got citizenship through a heteronormative culture. So I did, um, was through marriage. So um, for my brother who has been here just for the same amount of time that I've been for years and he is trying to he obviously works in the country, has been culturalized here. Our work ethic actually is very American. So if I would go back to my country, I don't, I don't even have ties. I don't have, um, we don't have the same system and I have to like basically start from zero. So I just think that's interesting how citizenship is uh, part of your entire life, it doesn't matter. You know, and then once you have papers, your status changes completely. And he does. Like, my brother can't work outside of the university. Um, and then under Trump's administration, he was, they suggested, he had, he's having a lot of problems with papers, but they suggested that he would have to apply for um, a visa in which he has to prove that he can speak both English fluently and his native language fluently and then he has to have a master's and prove that he got and then if you had your GD you wouldn't be able to apply for that visa so just for the opportunity to be able to work here um, and I think so he wouldn't be outside of his status um, and I mean my mom's a citizen she's been here forever um, we've I've been here for 17 years. So it's just been an interesting process talking even about like changing the rhetoric about being proud of having citizenship and thinking how those are measures that are actually impeding people from living here in, um, in decent ways, you know? And then when I think of my brother, I don't think him as an illegal immigrant, like how people perceive, right? Not, only undocumented they think of illegal um, in a sense of you don't have a status but also he is white so there's a very fine um, there's so many issues with that situation but I just wanted to share that um, it's in your daily life and shapes your life all the time right it shapes your rights it shapes the way you connect with people it shapes how you can work it shapes uh, your relationship with friends. So, um, yeah. So it's just like, instead of like being proud of having citizenship, just think about how change a little bit of the rhetoric and think how citizenship actually is limiting you from like, you have to have money too. So you spend a lot of money trying to have those papers. You know? So, um, it's just, it's more of a limiting thing instead of an opening your horizon. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing all that. I think it's really, um, you're pointing to so many of the problems with the system and so many of the things that um, people who are, you know, US born citizens or uh, who and just aren't in contact with, with immigrants at all, just completely take for granted. And you're also pointing to, you know, the, the, um, obscurity of the or the, the opacity of the immigration system and to get you know even if you have a job you have a degree whatever to actually be able to get a visa um and how um, challenging it can be and then yeah if you don't have now gay marriage gives you access uh to marriage citizenship but that's only been in the last few years it wasn't a possibility before and of course that only works if you're at least you know so much over the poverty line and don't have any uh, you know, convictions of any kind. And, you know, I mean, so it's, it's, it's not straightforward. So um, thank you for sharing your, your situation, your brother's situation. I, I, I also thank you for sharing um, the difficult situation. And as Karma said, like, I appreciate the themes that you 
raised for us to think about, including like the very restrictive rules available for even possibilities for getting status. Um, and then the dilemmas for folks who actually can perhaps follow that path, right? Um, so migrants are required to invest in and believe in citizenship. Um, and it's not something you can not, you can just say, I won't or I don't, right? Because to be a migrant is to be um, in a precarious situation, right? So it isn't a yes or a no questions, but some of what that highlights is the requirement for migrants to invest in citizenship and dominant stories of how this is supposed to work um, and the pain and who gets left out, including who we love, who are our families, who sits at the same table. Um, it's really a terrible system. Um, I don't think it's on migrants to solve this, I think some of what I think about is those with citizenship need to keep thinking about how to challenge the system. And I appreciate the work of folks like Nandita Sharma and Harsha Walia, who describe that these distinctions are rooted in global apartheid, that citizens often don't think about, and so citizens don't challenge these, like the, the significance of those status distinctions and their roots in imperial histories. Um, so part of what you know, I talk about in my classes and the book talks about is just to help people to understand that context. Um, and it's not like there's an obvious clear cut solution of what to do, but to at least have the conversation about the complexities of um, being expected to invest in citizenship, because if you don't, there's a big consequence, but if you do, there also is. And that that's really, really difficult and very painful. So I appreciate that you would share all of that. Do we have any other questions or comments? Oh, here we go. Juliana says, could you share some literary, fictional, and non-fictional works that could be used in the classroom? OK, wait. What is a literary, fictional, or non-fictional? And I ask you as a person who doesn't read fiction, um, and can you say, what classroom are we talking about? Because I think it depends where we teach, right? So tell us a little more. Um, I teach the Spanish and Portuguese. I teach literature. So, um, but uh, I was just thinking about uh, literature, in, in essentially. But fiction and nonfiction that would discuss the situation, or um, or it would discuss, you know, the queer uh, aspect or migrants, because. You know, I love hearing all this, but we also would like to teach to students um, from Im different imaginaries. Um, so if you guys have anything, that would be great. Other than your I'll book, mention two and other people should feel free. Um, I have a student who's working on Fiebre Tropical, um, which is a Colombian queer migrant um, who ends up in Miami, whose mom goes to one of those mega churches in a mall. It's a really incredible piece of work. The feminist press published it. So that one and that, that these are both in English though. Then the other is actually Jesus Valle's play on documents. Um, I think is a really extraordinary piece of work that addresses actually lots of these themes and also being in a, a, a mixed status family. Um, he got status and he has a brother who does not have status um, and what that is like. So um, others, please post suggestions. Yeah, I never read uh, literature, but what I would say is, um, that there, the one of the things we try to do in our book is to include uh, basically, you know, activist voices that weren't written like academic essays. And so in the book, there's, you know, I can't remember the exact eight, eight or so pieces that are short form that are written by activists um, about their experiences. And they're really um, very straightforward in the way they're written. And so would be appropriate for an undergraduate classroom. But others, yeah, should free, feel free to offer their resources too.
any other final thoughts, feel free to unmute yourself or toss it in the chat on anything that we've um, discussed today. Ah, yes. Hi, Frank. Frank Galarte says, uh, Jaime Cortez's uh, graphic novel, Sexile. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, H. Obeja's work, <laughs> um, her novels. We came all the way from Cuba so you could dress like this. That's one among many of them. <laughs> okay, well, great. We have no other questions or comments. I want to say, um, oh, there's another. Cassie Smith. Yeah, that's Jesus is there, so good. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's lots of suggestions in the chat for everyone to reference. Um, okay, yeah, people are just saying, they're expressing their thank you. So I want to also say thank you to Karma and Aitha for this uh, lovely conversation. I thought it was uh, really engaging. Thank you so much to our audience for, for tuning in this afternoon. Um, if you'd like to um, come to other LAII events, uh, you can see them all on, listed on our website at laii.unm.edu. Um, and thank you again, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you all so much. It's great to thank see you all. Thank you so much. And thank you to those who hosted us. We really appreciate it. We really do. Thank next you. Time, next time, hopefully, we'll all be together in Albuquerque. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. Bye. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you.